Good evening, everyone. You are all welcome back to our anatomy classes. And um, today we are going to be taking anatomy of the intestine, the small and large intestine, and then the anal canal. But probably we are going to divide the lectures into two segments, the small intestine, the large intestine, then the rectum and the anal canal. And we should know that um, the small intestine, we are going to commence with the anatomy with, of the small intestine, okay? The small intestine is a very important um, part of the bowel it's important in digestion and absorption of nutrients. And of course, we know it's made up of three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. We've discussed the anatomy of the duodenum along with the stomach. So today, we are going to concentrate on the jejunum and ileum. And we should know that all these parts, are, they all have varying functions. And the purpose of this lecture is for you to know the um, typical difference between all these parts of the intestine and their specific features as well as their specific functions, okay? Now, generally, we know that the, the jejunum and the ileum, okay, uh, have similar structures, but in due course, we'll see what actually differentiates both, and that is the important aspect of discussing the anatomy of the small bowel. Now, the small intestine is an organ located within the gastrointestinal tract. It's approximately 6.5 meters, okay, in the average person, okay. And it assists in digestion, and absorption of ingested food. What is the extent? It extends from the pylorus of the stomach to the ileocecal junction, where it meets the large intestine at the ileocecal valve. Okay. Now, anatomically, as we said, there are three parts, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And they all have the same layers, okay? The mucosa layer, the submucosa layer, the muscularis, which is made up of the internal circular muscles and the outer longitudinal muscle. And this is covered by a serosa. So this, is a typical structure of the intestine and it runs down in the same manner. Now, we've already discussed the anatomy of the duodenum. Previously, we said um, a lot about it along with the anatomy of the stomach. But however, the duodenum is the most proximal portion of the small intestine. And the name is derived from what? 12 finger length. Duodenum digitorum, meaning 12 finger length. Okay? So that is about 25 centimeters. So it runs from the pylorus of the stomach 
to the Diodino jejunal junction. At the Diodino jejunal junction, it is attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the ligament of trixi, and it is that junction where you have commencement of the jejunal. The jejunum and the ileum are the distal two parts of the small intestine. In contrast to the duodenum, they are intraperitoneal. As we mentioned, it is the first two cm okay, of the duodenum that is intraperitoneal, the duodenal cap, the first 2.5 centimeters of the duodenum, but all other parts of it are retroperitoneal. Now, the jejunum and the ileum, on the other hand, are intraperitoneal, and they are attached to the posterior abdominal wall by mesentery. We've discussed the anatomy of the peritoneum. Okay, the jejunum begins at the duodenojejunal flexure, as we mentioned. And you should know when you see the small intestine, you will not see a clear cut demarcation between the jejunum and the ileum. Okay, however, there are some certain features you observe on this bowel that tells you these are uh, that differentiate both. And this is very important when you are operating on the intestine for you to be able to identify what part of the bowel you are handling. Now, the ileum ends at the ileocecal junction. And at this ileocecal junction is a valve, the ileocecal valve that invaginates the cecum. okay? And the function is to prevent reflux of the large bowel content into the small bowel content. Now, as we said, this, small intestine is intraperitoneal and it is attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the mesentery, okay? This image demonstrates the mesentery after excising the small bowel from the mesentery. You can see that about 6.5 meter 6.5 meter long intestine is being held together in the peritoneal cavity by a 15 centimeter um, root of the mesentery, meaning it must have multiple folds and must appear in coils, okay? Now the mesentery extend from the DJ junction here at the level of L2, don't forget, okay? At the level of L2 to the level of the sarcoiliac joint. And this length is about 15 cm extending from and this is what is carrying about 6.5 uh, meters of bowel. So it extends from the DJ junction at the left of the second lumbar vertebra and runs diagonally downwards from the left to right to the iliocecal junction in front of the right sacroiliac joint. Though only 15 centimeters length, okay, separate this point about five to seven meters of intestine are attached. So hence it will appear in a coil. 
Now, within this mesentery, if you observe, it contains the superior mesenteric vessels, both the artery and the veins, lymphatic lymph nodes, as well as autonomic nerve fibers. The blood supply to this mesentery, sorry, the blood supply to the intestine is carried within the mesentery. Now, you need to understand the structure of this small boil, okay? And it's adjacent blood supply. Now, within this mesentery, the blood vessels are arranged in a pattern of arterial arcades and vasa recta. This is the superior mesenteric artery that is supplying the intestine. Branches from the superior mesenteric artery supplying the jejunum and ileum are termed the intestinal arteries, okay? And these intestinal arteries, they arise from the superior mesenteric vessel in form of arcades, arterial arcades, okay? These are various acute arteries or arterial arcades. And from these arterial arcades arise the vasa recta. The vasa recta now supplies the intestine. Now it is from this bowel wall, the vasa recta and the arterial arcades that will help you in differentiating the jejunum from the ileum. Now you should note that the vasa recta of the mesenteric vessels are longer and straight in the jejunum with only one or two arcades. Okay, so if this is the jejunum, you just have fewer arcades, okay, just one or two. Then you have a longer vasa recta. Don't forget the arterial arcades of the jejunum are fewer and they have a longer vasa recta. You just have one or two arterial arcades, giving up the vasa recta, supplying the jejunum. okay? Then for the vasa recta, for the vasa recta of the ileum, okay, they are shorter and they have numerous arcades. So you have numerous arterial arcades and short, they have shorter vasa recta. So this difference in terms of vessels differentiate jejunum from ileum macroscopically when you observe. But we are going to see all the classical difference. The difference is you look at the, the thickness of the bowel wall, the appearance of the inner mucosa, the vasa recta, and the arterial arcades. Okay? These are the four points you commonly use in differentiating the jejunum from the ileum. Now you should know that the jejunum has bigger and more closely packed plice circularis, otherwise volvule conventis. These folds, these are mucosal folds that are called volvule conventis. They are more marked in 
the jejunum and very faint or even absent in the ileum. So one of the major difference, if you look at the inner lining, inner mucosa of the jejunum, it is lined by what is termed plice circularis or volvule conventis, which are nothing but mucosal folds. That is one. Two, they have longer vasa recta as described. They have longer vasa recta. And three, they have thicker walls. The wall of the jejunum is thicker than the wall of the ileum. Okay, so the wall is thicker. Now, the diameter of the jejunum is greater than the diameter of the ileum. You should also note that the jejunum has larger and more closely packed villi. Okay, these villi are projections within the mucosa of the intestine. They are more packed in the jejunum. Hence, the jejunum has a greater digestive and absorptive surface. Because these villi, the villi is more numerous in the jejunum. The jejunum has more digestive and absorptive surface. You should know that most of the nutrients are absorbed in the jejunum carbohydrate, proteins in form of amino acids, okay? Lipids are all absorbed in the jejunum. My, uh, vitamins and minerals are also absorbed in the jejunum. Digestion of most of these substances also occur in the jejunum. The ileum mainly is responsible for absorbing vitamin B12, okay? Uh, intrinsic factor and bile, okay? Bile salt is being absorbed in the terminal ileum. So because of this, you have more of the absorptive surface in the jejunum. Now also you should know that Translucent windows are present in the mesentery at the edge of the jejunal wall. Now, if you look at the edge of this jejunal wall, okay, you will see some, the mesentery, you can see through. Okay, it's translucent, you can see through. So it's easy when you want to make, create a window before creating an, uh, an uh, before resecting a bowel. Okay, you create a window, ligate the vessels, then you now divide before excising the intestine. However, the translucency are present in the mesentery at the edge of the jejunum. No such window in the ileal mesentery because the fat in the mesentery reach, reaches the ileal wall. So at this time, the ileum generally, this is not very translucent. You have deposit of fat. Sometimes, because of that, if you are trying to create mesenteric window, it is more cumbersome than when creating a mesenteric window in the jejunum. Here, you will enter a blood vessel. You enter a blood vessel, it tends to bleed, okay? So opening window here tends to give more bleeding in some cases during surgery than opening window in the jejunum because of this um, anatomy, okay? Okay.
So, um, the J genome, what is the length of the J genome with respect to the entire um, small intestine? It makes up to fifth of the total, okay? It makes up to fifth of the total length of the small intestine, okay? That is about 1.5 to 3.5 meters. Macroscopically, notably, are many parallel running circular pools in the mucosa. You can also call them the valves of Kekrin, Volvule conoventis, Plyce circularis, anyone you see is the same. The J genome has a typical histological pattern as the entire length of the intestine, okay? It's mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. Yes, this is the typical, we've discussed that. Now, you should know one typical feature of the mucosa, of the lining of um, the J genome is this crypt of Libacum, okay? It is characterized by crypt of Libacum that is uh, absent. They say the mucosa is lined by simple columnar epithelium towards the lumen, okay? It contains enterocytes and goblet cells. Characteristic feature are the crypts of Libacum, which secretes, okay, a lot of, that produce a lot of secretion and finger-like projections, which increase the surface area of this J genome as we discussed. Now, this is very important. You know, the submucosa contains loose connective tissue with blood vessel, lymph node, and the mesner's plexus. You should know that the mesner's plexus is a submucosal plexus. In your MCQs, you shouldn't confuse it with the myenteric plexus. Mesner is submucosal plexus. The myenteric plexus or the alveolar plexus are in in between the muscle layers. So in the submucosa, you have the mesner's plexus and they are parasympathetic. As usual, the muscularis has the inner circular outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle between which is the albax plexus or the myenteric plexus. The entire J genome is covered by serosa from the outsides, which consists of simple squamous epithelium and a connective tissue layer underneath. Now, you should know that histologically, the J genome is differentiated from the rest of the small intestine by the absence of two things the Bronner's gland the duodenum and the pears patches of the ileum. However, it has a single layer of folli uh, follicles, okay? The pears patches are lymphoid aggregates that characterize the ileum, which we shall see, okay? It is absent in the jejunum. Now, you can see the ileum is longer than the jejunum. It makes up about three-fifths of the total length of the small intestine, about 2.5 to 3.5 meters, okay? Compared to the jejunum, the parallel running cycle, circular fold in the mucosa are less prominent. We've talked about this. The volvule conventis are less prominent. You don't see them in the ileum. 
It also has a thinner wall. When you feel the texture during your operation, you will notice that it has a thinner wall. And in fact, it is even more transparent because of the wall is thinner. However, it is rich in lymphoid follicles. It is very rich in lymphoid follicles. In terms of histology, the mucosa of the ileum consists of simple columnar epithelium comprising of erythrocyte and goblet cells. Now, a characteristic histological feature of the ileum is the Peyer's patches, which are aggregates of lymphoid tissues. In fact, the aggregate, the lymphoid tissue in the intestine is more numerous than any part of the body. In fact, that's why intestinal transplant has the highest failure or rejection rates. It's not in, uh, but because of the high concentration of lymphatic aggregate in the intestine. That's why transplant has a high rejection rate. Now, compared to the rest of the small intestine, the circular folds are rather flat and the villi relatively short. We know most of the absorption is just of the uh, vitamin B12, as well as the, uh, what do you call it, bile salt. And the content is fecalate, okay? The content in the ileum, especially the terminal ileum, is fecalent. It is when this fecalent um, content enters the large intestine, it becomes fecal because up to 90% of the water is now absorbed by the large intestine. So, the contents also have fecal odor. Most of the useful nutrients have been absorbed. Okay, so it's just the difference between these contents in that terminal aspect and what is going into the colon is just the consistency. That in the ileum is liquid, and that in this colon, when the water is absorbed, it becomes solid, okay? A characteristic feature of the ileum is the pear's patches lying in the lamina propria of the mucosa, okay, and in the submucosa, okay? It is important part of the gout, that is the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And these pear's patches, Okay, one pair patch is around two to five centimeter long, one patch. And it consists of, each patch consists of about 300 aggregates of lymphoid follicles and the parafollicular lymphoid tissues. Okay. We said each of this patch is about 2.5 to 5 cm. It contains multiple lymphoid follicles within it, and also a dome. The dome-like bulge above one follicle is called dome area. M cells, microfold cells, are found in the dome epithelium, which are counted among the follicle-associated epithelial cells. What is the what is the function of this? Okay. 
Their function is to pick up antigens from the intestinal lumen and transport them to the antigen presenting cells. What you need to understand, because of that terminal ileum or the ileum is rich in these lymphoid tissues. When they are exposed to an infection or an antigen, they are being picked up by the antigen presenting cells, okay? Initially, they might not trigger any inflammatory reaction at the first exposure. Okay, these antigens are presented to T cells. Okay, they are presented to lymphocytes. Okay, and the T helper cells are converted to memory cells and they store that information for subsequent exposure. Now, when you have memory cells formed at that terminal ileum, for subsequent exposure, they will now attack the antigen. And in that process, they trigger a lot of inflammation, which might even cause ulceration in the payer's patches. And when there is ulceration, they might bleed torrentially from the payer's patches, from the inflammation and ulceration, because if there's inflammation, you know, there's going to be what? Edema, congestion, capillary ischemia, necrosis. When there's necrosis, there will be what? Ulceration. This type of reaction is what we see in typhoid enteritis, okay? In the first week, when the organism is taken up, they have bacteremia without any um, ulceration occurring at the payer's patches. But however, that cascade of events of sensitization of the memory cells occur. With subsequent exposure in the second week, okay, from the gallbladder, because when it goes into the system, they are stored in the bile, okay? As the bile secretes again, memory cells have been formed, okay? And inflammation occurs, there's ulceration. So that's why you see patients with that typhoid enteritis may present with lower GI bleeding. When it ulcerates, they bleed torrentially. And in the third week, when there are ulcers, are so marked and it has eaten through the bowel wall. They perforate, okay? It eats through the bowel wall and they present with generalized peritonitis from typhoid ileal perforation. That's why you see perforation of typhoid occur in the terminal ileum. This is just a table that differentiates um, the jejunum from the ileum. So the jejunum located in the upper left quadrant, ileum located in the lower right quadrant. Okay. The jejunum thick intestinal wall, the ileum thin intestinal wall, jejunum long vasa recti, the straight arteries. Then ileum short vasa recti, okay. Jejunum less arcades, ileum more arcades. Jejunum red in color, ileum pink in color. And you should also remember the ileum is lower, inferior, so it has. Shorter, vasa recti, inferior, okay. What again? Lower wall, okay. What again? Now 
Now is the blood supply of the intestine. We mentioned that the branches from the superior mesenteric artery supplying the intestine are termed the intestinal artery. The superior mesenteric artery is a branch from the abdominal aorta. The jejunum and ileum are supplied by 15 to 18 branches of the superior mesenteric arteries called the jejunal and ileal arteries. They anastomose with each other to form arterial arcades, which send numerous straight arteries, vas recta, to the jejunum and the ileum. The small intestine drain into the portal vein. The veins accompany arterial branches to form the superior mesenteric vein. Don't forget the superior mesenteric vein, okay, joins the portal vein, if you remember, okay, the superior mesenteric vein joins the splenic vein behind the neck of the pancreas to form the portal vein, okay? The superior mesenteric vein, which joins the splenic vein behind the neck of the pancreas in the transpyloric plane, L1, L2, to form the portal vein, okay? The lymph of the small intestine is drained into the superior mesenteric uh, lymph nodes. What is the nerve supply or the nervous distribution of the intestine? The small intestine is innervated by branches of the vagus nerve. Okay, that is the cranial nerve 10 and thoracic splanchnic nerves. Their nerve branches extend throughout the entire length of the small intestine to form two plexuses. Now, this is very important you know as well as remember because I'm emphasizing these because you see them in MCQs, trying to confuse you. Replacing mesna for my enteric plexus. The submucosal plexus of Mesna found in the submucosa of the small intestine contains only parasympathetic input from the vagus nerve. The myenteric plexus of Auerbach, located in the muscularis externa of the small intestine, contains sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. You can memorize using the mnemonic SMP, submucosa, okay, mesna, and what? Parasympathetic. Maps, my enteric, arrowbacks, parasympathetic and sympathetic. Now I've seen a question on this where it was interchanged. Secondly, you should know when we talk about the clinical application, let me add this, um, hash Brown's disease. Okay. So the clinical application, you should know uh, the short bowel syndrome. There was a time I had a patient that was referred from, uh, that was referred to me, okay? She had several operation from a peripheral hospital where, um, of course, initially it was cesarean section she had elsewhere. 
and a foreign body, abdominal mop, was left, was forgotten in her abdomen. And unfortunately, that was there for about two years. And it caused a lot of admissions and entered, burrowed through most of her small and large intestine. Initially, uh, she was representing to the hospital. They were giving her treatment for uh, peptic ulcer without any relief. Eventually, she became obstructed and they went in. And of course, most of the small intestine they could not see. And it was, uh, they removed, they took her for serial excision of small bowel. When she presented to me then, I saw her. Uh, she was having a very high output enterocutaneous fistula. And I counseled them that um, they are, she has to be on uh, parenteral nutrition. And secondly, even without this enterocutaneous fistula, she already has short bowel syndrome. Most of the functional part, anatomical and functional part of the small bowel is lost. So the patient cannot absorb the nutrients. They cannot digest and absorb nutrients because they've lost most of the intestine. And of course, when I commenced her on parenteral nutrition, drugs that reduce secretions, motility of the small intestine for some time, okay, I plan to exteriorize to control that. Unfortunately, intra-op, I found only 90 centimeters. Intestine. If we say the intestine is about, okay, 600 centimeters, okay? And you can imagine how much of that bowel have been resected in that peripheral hospital. And of course, when I saw that, it was so worrisome because she has an end fistula of the jejunum. The jejunum was there's a complete circumferential opening that was leaking whatsoever she takes out. So that if she survives, she will have short bowel syndrome. And of course, she was in the ICU for over a month, severally. She lost all her physiological mechanisms. And of course, ultimately she died after the relatives have spent up to uh, over 9 million naira in resuscitating her. Of course, moral justification, you cannot just let such patient go. You have to do your best. So, short bowel syndrome, when most of the small intestine are resected, okay, from surgery or following trauma, or they might even be a disease that will cause destruction of the absorptive surface of the small intestine. So they are functionally useless. They cannot absorb nutrients. This patient will now be presenting with severe diarrhea, features of malnutrition, hypovitaminosis, and a lot of uh, an immunosuppression because they are not uh, utilizing nutrients, okay? So this is a very important uh, syndrome you need to read about and you need to know about, especially as a general surgeon. You need to know how to manage that. But this goes beyond the scope of our discussion here. Now, diarrhea, several diarrhea occur in a patient with conditions that could either be infective in the small intestine like salmonellosis, shigellosis, or diarrhea could um, result from osmotic diarrhea when concentration of the constituent is so much and complex to be broken down and absorbed 
In fact, that concentrated substances will even pull more uh, fluid into the lumen and worsen the diarrhea. The typhoid perforation, we've talked about it, okay, which usually occur at the end of the second week and beginning of the third week. At the second week, at the first week, they have bacteremia. At the second week, they have septicemia. At the third week, they have perforation. They can have torrential lower GI bleeding from the bleeding ulcers, which eventually might perforate the entire thickness of the bowel wall. And um, they now present with generalized peritonitis, okay? Gastrointestinal stromal tumor, GIST, is a tumor uh, that affects the intestine, the stomach and its intestine. It's a malignant condition of which 50%, it accounts for 1% of all gastrointestinal malignancy, of which 50% are located in the stomach. 50% of GIST are located in the stomach. The next area that you find GIST aside the stomach is the small intestine, okay? So GIST is a malignant tumor that can affect the small intestine and is a cause of intestinal obstruction. And in the stomach, it can cause um, gastric outlet obstruction. Now, the ileocecal valve has several functions. During colonoscopy, it serves as, the, as a landmark. It shows you that you have gotten to the end. Okay, you have gotten to where uh, your, your terminal, your termination point, even though we will see that when discussing colon. Now, the ileocecal valve also, you should know, in a closed loop obstruction, maybe when there is obstruction, okay, you have the valve, yeah, when there is obstruction of the colon, maybe this is a tumor causing obstruction with a competent ileocecal valve. This is competent, meaning the contents cannot go back to the small intestine. You have a closed loop obstruction, okay? So you have a closed loop here. Causes of closed loop obstruction is one, large bowel obstruction with a competent ileocecal valve. Sigmoid volvulus, obstructed hernias. Okay, when you have obstruction within the sac, it can also give a closed loop. And these rapidly, okay, causes ischemia, necrosis, perforation. This is an emergency that you need to address. So this is also what you need to know about the ileocecal uh, valve in a, in a colonic obstruction with patent, competent ileocecal valve, they could have closed loop obstruction. Now, x-ray of um, plain abdominal x-ray for intestinal obstruction. Remember, we said that the jejunum has the plicy circularis or the volvule conventis, which are mucosal foods. Now, when you have SBO, small bowel obstruction, you know, the investigation you do for a patient presenting with intestinal obstruction amongst the investigation is plain abdominal x-ray.
erect and supine. So plain abdominal x-ray, erect and supine. Okay, so on the erect, it will show you multiple airflow level. While in the supine, it shows you the character of the obstructed bowel. Now for small bowel obstruction, if the jejunum is obstructed, you have prominent volvuli conventis. Okay, and you see it appearing as transverse longitudinal radio opaque folds extending from what? One end of the ball to another. It shows you that the obstruction, there's jejunal obstruction. So that is also very important. You um, take note of that. And small bowel obstruction, usually they present with um, early vomiting. There is no marked distension. Constipation is late and the fluid and electrolyte derangement is marked. And Hirschsprung's disease, we shall talk about that when we um, talk about the large bowel. But um, I think we are going to stop here and entertain questions, okay? So if you have any question, we are going to take large bowel rectum um, and our canal separate. So if you have any question, please, you can unmute yourself, okay? And you ask any question. <laughs>